Amen. Amen. Tonight we are going to continue our chapter by chapter study of the book of Deuteronomy. And remember, right off the bat, the title Deuteronomy, it literally means the second law. That's what that title means, the second law. However, the Hebrews, the originators of the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, they have a different title for this book. Their title is These Are the Words. Why is that the title? Because the Jews have this tradition to often, not always, but often name their books after the first couple of words in the book itself. And if you look back to chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, Deuteronomy starts out, these are the words. And they're like, that's a great name for the book. We'll call it, these are the words. I like their title, though, because it's much more appropriate to what the content really is. Deuteronomy is not just a second telling of the law. It is that, but it's Moses' final words to the children of Israel. You see, Deuteronomy is a series of five sermons preached by Moses over a period of five weeks, 37 days to be exact. And guess what? We're covering this book at the exact same speed, five sermons over five weeks, which means, again, we're on the same exact pace that Moses did when he originally spoke the book of Deuteronomy. And this book is of such importance. It was one of the favorites of the New Testament apostles and even of Jesus. Why would I say it? Because remember, Deuteronomy is the third most quoted book in the New Testament from the Old Testament. Third behind Psalms and Isaiah. And if that isn't enough information to say this deserves our attention, Jesus quoted this book second only to the book of Psalms in the sermons that he preached. So Deuteronomy is worth us to give our attention to as Jesus used it, the apostles used it. It was huge to them. Five sermons that Moses preached. The first one we looked at last Wednesday night where Moses encourages the people to remember their history. He goes back all that God has done for them, all of the faithfulness and the reminder of God's past faithfulness means he will be faithful to us in the future. Amen? It's why it's good to remember how good God has been to us. Then tonight we see him telling us to remember our God. Next week the sermon topic is remember the law. Then they're to remember their covenant and finally their leader, Mr. Mo himself. But tonight we are in that second sermon where Moses wants the people to remember God. And listen, we have a pretty amazing God, don't we? who he is, how we should respond to that. Well, that's the point of Moses' second sermon. And as you're taking notes tonight, as you're writing some things down, maybe to help you to remember the, the content of it, what we're gonna see tonight, first of all, is what God did, what, what he did for us. Then secondly, we're gonna see what we should do, what our response should be to all that God has done for us. And then as we respond in the final chapter, we'll see what will God do as we respond to him. So look at those one at a time. Direct your attention to chapter five. And we see Moses remind his people and us of what God did. It says there in verse one, and Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes, the judgments, which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, and the Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain in the midst of the fire, and I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord in, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. At your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. The Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and then I may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words the Lord spoke to all of your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thickness, and a loud voice, and he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and he gave them to me. Moses wants the children of Israel to remember how blessed they really are. How so? That God came down and gave them his law. He didn't give it to Abraham or to Jacob or to Joseph. Moses says, God came down to us. He gave us insight into how life is supposed to work. And Moses is getting them to see, this is such a blessing. And church, the reality is the same is true for us today. It is a blessing that we have the privilege to open up God's word to read it, to study it together. I know people say to you, what are you doing tonight? I'm going to church. Is it a Sunday? No, it's a Wednesday. There's church on a Wednesday? There is at the garden. Why are you doing that? And they just look like you already put in an hour. Why are you doing that? And I hope the attitude of your heart is, What a privilege it is to study God's word, to hang out in his presence, to let him speak into our lives. Why? We are lost without it. Amen? We're lost. I mean, some of you can remember what life was like before you knew the Lord, before he gave you his word. You remember what life was like, lived on your own intuition and thoughts, and what a mess. How frustrating. I have God's word, and I feel like I'm barely hanging on. I need to be in God's presence. I need to let him speak truth into my life so I don't walk in air, and I feel so blessed that he'd love me enough to tell me the truth about life. That's what Moses is saying. He's given them, he's, God's given us a way to live and he reiterates to them the 10 commandments. And it's worth us taking just a couple of minutes to remember this law of God given to all people at all time as the best way to live. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. You know there are so much other things that we can worship, other things that compete for our attention. But those things that we put in front of God, they will never satisfy, church. They will never live up to what they promise. God is telling this, again, because he loves us. So what do we do about those false things we put ahead of God in our lives? Well, I think the first commandment is not just a premise that there's other things we can worship. It's also a promise. You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, instead of being worried about how to deal with all the other things that bid for my attention, if you and I would just focus on enthroning the Lord in our hearts, focusing on him, worshiping him, drawing near to him, he will put down all those idols in our lives. No other gods before me. Second commandment, Don't make any idols. The first commandment is making sure we worship the right God. The second commandment is making sure we worship the right way. You see, the ancients would create these these idols, these gods in their image. This is the way we think God is like. 
And the problem with that, it should be obvious, but our God is so radically different from the images in our wicked heart. So when I put my image on God, I miss out, first of all, worshiping who he truly is. I miss out worshiping who he truly is. And remember, God's goal is to shape you and I into his image. And so I don't want a false image. I want the image of the true and living God before my eyes so that I can be shaped and do exactly what God wants me and you to be. Don't make any other gods. Don't make any idols. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And this one, he actually, he actually gives us a warning to it. Why? Because I think we need it. We tend to take the third commandment and say, what's the big deal? It's just cussing. It's just cussing. I mean, you know, if we just use the name of the Lord, it doesn't really mean what it means. And in our world today, the name of the Lord is used to cuss. It's used to show anger, to show excitement. You're texting your friends. OMG. What's the big deal about that, pastor? What happens is when we flippantly use and listen on TV and movies, the name of God and words like hell and damnation, those words experience a terrible trivialization in our hearts. People try to explain to me all the time, oh, when I put OMG, I didn't really mean God. Well, that's exactly the point, isn't it? The name of God, the only name given under heaven by which you must be saved. We relegate it to a woo. Just say woo. Like, <laughs> don't take the name that is higher than every other name to show you're excited. We lessen these things, and God who loves you says, I don't want these words lessened in your heart. The fourth one, keep the Sabbath. You think people would love that God said, one of my rules is you need a day off. Like, I like this God. That's amazing. But that's not people's reaction to the Sabbath. E either they ignore it. They say, oh, that sounds good. But, you know, you can't take off one day and, and, and rule the world. So, so I'm just going to work, 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 work till I, till I fall apart. They ignore it or they explore it. They say, well, I'll try that. I'll try the Sabbath every once in a while if I ever get a day off. You know, these are commandments. These aren't things to be explored. These are things to be obeyed. I don't want my kids obeying thou shalt not, or exploring thou shalt not kill. Well, I've been exploring that this week, Dad, but if someone really cuts me off, I might decide, no, no, no. Some adore the Sabbath. They get all legalistic. It has to be Saturday, and you can't do anything on that day. But church, instead of deploring or ignoring or exploring or adoring, we should just restore it. We should take one day in seven and be obedient to Jesus and take a day off. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. The word honor there means to give weight. We're to give weight to the position of our mom and dad and watch the way we talk about them and interact with them, watch our hearts toward them. We need to realize the commandment is not just for kids. When the New Testament repeats the commandment, Paul explicitly addresses kids and he adds to it, obey. Kids are to obey their mother and father. But all of us, no matter what your age, no matter what your parents' age, you are to honor the position of your mother and father. And I know some of you come from terrible homes and they don't, they don't deserve that honor. You are doing this to honor God not necessarily them. We honor our actual parents. We honor our in-laws. I think really anyone that has authority over us. The sixth commandment, do not murder. This is where most of us go, good, I got this one. I've never killed anybody. That's good, I'm glad you haven't. <laughs> but remember, this applies to human life at any age, at any stage. That makes the guilty net a little bigger. Jesus also commented on this commandment. He said it applies when I harbor hatred in my heart to somebody. And I've committed mental murder many times before, <laughs> driving around all the time. I have to admit, guilty, but you know what? There's forgiveness. The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. This one I think we just think we know what it means so clearly, but understand the term adultery means un unlawful sex. That means any time we take sex outside of God's design, the covenant of marriage, and we place it somewhere it doesn't belong. 
And though there is a serious difference, obviously, between lust, between pornography, between fornication, adultery, and homosexuality, they are all taking sex where God never intended it to be. And each of those actions, if we give into them, separate our hearts from God. And so again, because God loves us, he says, avoid them. Keep intimacy where God says it'll be a blessing and not a curse. The eighth commandment, do not steal. Again, we say, good, I've never put on a ski mask and robbed a bank. I'm really good. But grand larceny is not the only way to violate this commandment. Most of us have jobs. We are paid to work hours and during those work hours to perform that task. And most of us have on occasion taken hours when we're paid to do something else and we're doing something totally different. <laughs> That's stealing, friends. And we need to repent. We can steal from our employers. We can steal from our government. There's something coming up next Monday. Have you heard? For the first time in my life, there was a mistake made on withholdings. I wrote the U.S. government an $11,000 check yesterday. I'm still not over that. <laughs> like when I spend $11,000, I expect a small car. That's what I expect. <laughs> I expect. I expect something that's going to really bless my family. But they're doing such a crack job, a good job. So just kidding. Anyways, we'll move on. I don't want to get too political. We can steal from our employers. We can steal from our government. I thought about it yesterday. We can steal from our government. We can steal from our employers we can steal from the Lord, friends, in the form of not giving to him what is his, in the form of tithes and offerings. We need to make sure God loves us. He doesn't want us to steal. The ninth commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness. And we, we, we read that and we, we think it's easy. It just means do not lie. And that's, that's true. That's a good interpretation of thou shalt not bear false witness. But it's, it's actually more than that. There's only one example in all of the scripture where someone is told they were bearing false witness and it was at the trial of Jesus. When the Jewish leaders brought in these, these false witnesses and they said of Jesus, he said, destroy this temple and three days I will raise it up again. Now why I'm using that example and bringing it up is because I want to remind you of something. Jesus actually did say that. He, he said it, but probably more like this. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. But they were saying, he's going to destroy the temple. He's going to destroy the temple there in Jerusalem. So in other words, they had the right information, but the wrong application. The right information, but they were being tricky with the truth. And, and that's something we need to guard against. We can say, well, I didn't lie. That's what they said. Is that what they meant? Well, God loves you. He doesn't want these things tarnishing your reputation. Do not bear false witness. And the 10th one, do not covet. Covet is wanting more of what you already have enough of. And this commandment, I think, is one of the most significant. When we're not satisfied, when we want more stuff, we want more from a relationship, we want more relationships, we want more from this life, yet we go through the scriptures and what we find is all we need for life and godliness is found in him. Everything we need in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And you know who knows that besides God? The enemy knows that. So if the enemy can keep you always looking other places, then the one place you will be truly satisfied, he's one. Such wisdom in the law of God. Sometimes as Christians we think, well, the law, the law. I live under grace, man. Well, of course you live under grace. I don't live by the law. I'm not saved by the law. Of course you're not saved by the law. Neither was Abraham. Neither was Moses, by the way. They were saved by grace and blood sacrifice too. But when we, when we jerk back from, from the commandments, we forget that they are good. You know, I like to see them as, as 
imagining you live in the Amazon and you put up a fence to protect your kids from going where they shouldn't and to keep predators from getting in. The law is to to, to set up us a a parameter to keep us where we're really going to enjoy life without the pitfalls, without the predators. God says, I've taken you out of Egypt. Now you can truly be free. As John said in the New Testament, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. These commandments are not how we earn God's love. God already loves you and I more than we can possibly imagine. They actually are his love expressed to you and me. And that's what Moses is reminding the people of. We are so blessed. God has expressed his love to us through his commandments. And then Moses switches gears from what God has done for them to what we should do for him. And we can sum it up by three commands. We are to love God, we are to trust God, and we are to obey God. Did you get those? We are to love God, we are to trust God, and we are to obey God. The first commandment is we are to love God. Look at chapter six. Read the first couple verses as we did this weekend. It says, now, this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God and keep his statutes and commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it that it might be well with you and that you might multiply greatly as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates." The first response to all that God has done for us is we're to love him. And we see this in the main point here of this Hebrew Shema. We've been looking at this. We started last weekend in our weekend services going through the book of Deuteronomy. We're focusing in here on Deuteronomy chapter six in what is called the Hebrew Shema. Every Jewish person is required, and most of them do it, to memorize and repeat the Hebrew Shema every morning, every evening. The Orthodox Jews put two of the three Shema passages in that little box they wear on their heads, the phylacteries there, and they put one of the three Shema passages in the mezuzah, which they hang outside their homes. Many Jews repeat verse 4 and 5 of Deuteronomy 6 as the last thing they say before they die as an affirmation of their faith. And it's not just a Jewish cultural thing. For remember, Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What's the greatest part of the Old Testament? He reaches back into Deuteronomy chapter six. He focuses it on verse four and five. And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The word in Hebrew for hear is shema. It's where they get the title for the Hebrew Shema, to hear. The Lord wanted them to hear something. What did he want them to hear? He wanted them to hear that he is only one God. There's only one true and living God. And we talked about that last weekend. It's an affront to all the polytheistic religions in the world. The true and living God is only one. He doesn't come from a pantheon of gods. There is one true and living God. Amen? Amen. But... We looked at last weekend that even that though, when you just read the the, the Hebrew Shema in the original language, there's more to the oneness of God that meets the eye. For the name he uses of himself, Elohim, is a plural word. The the word one, achad, it's it's this idea of a compound unity. The Bible uses the same word when it says a a, a husband and wife become one. Well, as I said this weekend, they, they don't physically actually morph into one human being so it's, it's metaphorical. It's a, it's a compound unity. And God is saying, that's what I mean, that I am one. So when we believe in the Trinity, we're not contradicting the Hebrew Shema. There's always been more to the oneness of God than meets the eye. 
We believe in one God who exists eternally as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as I think on that, man, my mind just begins to short circuit and I realize what I need to realize. God, you are so bigger than I will ever pretend to be. You know more than I even think I know. (laughs) You are so big. And the natural response then, verse five, is to just love God with all that we are. You know, we'll, we'll focus more in on this this weekend, but can I just, can I just, I hope, encourage your heart that when they asked, what's the greatest commandment? Do you know there's 613 commandments according to Judaism in the Old Testament? And when they asked Jesus what the most important one was, his response was, love me with all that you are. That just sets me free. Does that set you free? I'm like, well, you gotta lead at least 50 people to Jesus. Nothing wrong with evangelism. Evangelism is awesome. Make sure you read this every year and twice on leap years. I don't know. I don't know. No one's ever told me that. But I, You know I'm a, I'm a Bible guy. I love reading the Bible and praying every single day. But that's not what God said either. He said, I just want you to love me. And we'll explore more this weekend what that really means. How do we really love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength? But as we, as we see this, then we go beyond it and, and, we, and we teach that to the next generation. If I'm gonna love him, I gotta love him with the way I live my life and I'm gonna pass it on to the next generation. And, and you know, kids are naturally full of questions. And, and sometimes that can be annoying. Why is the sky blue? Why? 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 You're like, I don't know. <laughs> They're naturally full of questions. I know it can be annoying, but listen, parents, grandparents, see it as an opportunity to turn the conversation to the things of the Lord. Bring the Lord into your home. The Bible's really clear. As you sit, as you travel, as you go, find time to talk to the next generation about the Lord. The church is one generation away from extinction, right? Right? That's why I love, you look around our church, yes, we have precious older men and women in this congregation. I see you. I'm not not looking. I see you. I'm so thankful for you and your maturity and your wisdom. But some churches, that's all that's in a church. And I look around and I see young men and women, middle-aged men and women like myself. I I see all generations. And you know what that tells me? This is a healthy place. This is a healthy place. The church is not just supposed to be where 20-year-olds hang out or 40-year-olds or 120-year-olds. That's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a community of believers across all ages as we pass on what we know to the generation coming behind us. Man, be intentional, parents, grandparents, in your home. How can you do it? Why, well, what do you put on your walls? You know, so often we can tell what inspires people by what's on their walls. Sports stars, recreation, beautiful art, family, nothing wrong with any of those things. But the Jewish people would have the word of God on the doorpost of their homes. And I, and I, credit, I credit my wife with this. When you walk into my home, the word of God is painted put on random pieces of wood she found somewhere. It's everywhere. In fact, my stepdad came over and he said, I can't even use the restroom in your house without reading the Bible. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. It's right there. And I love that about my wife and our home. And God says, do it. Practically love me. And then in chapter seven, trust him. Don't just love him, trust him. Look at chapter seven, verse one. It says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, which you go in to possess. Remember, they're not in there yet, and I love the Lord. When, it doesn't say if. When the Lord brings you into the land, which you go in to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivered them, delivers them into you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor shall you have mercy on them. You shall not make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor shall you take their daughter for your son, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. 
But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, burn their carved images for, with fire, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord God did not set his love on you nor chose you because you were more in number than other people, for you were least of all the peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy with thousands of generations with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face and destroys them. He will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay them to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments and statutes and judgments which I command you this day to observe them. Our first response for all that God does for us is to love him, to love him, to love him. Secondly, we are to trust him. It all comes down to faith, doesn't it? Do you and I really believe the Lord loves us and knows what is best for our life and our family's life? Do we really believe he knows what we are to avoid and what we're run to in this life? Do I really believe that and trust him? Because I must. God is telling the children of Israel once again to drive out the people who live in the land of Canaan. Do not intermarry with them or mix with them. And just so we're all clear here tonight, God by this is not forbidding interracial marriages in any way. This is God forbidding inner worship marriages. Marrying someone who worships a different God than you. That is what God is against. Whatever your skin color might be shouldn't matter to you. And I promise you, it does not matter to God. We are all children of God. But if you worship a different God, now that's the problem. God says, don't marry them or mix with them. I will deliver them into your hands, verse one. You need to drive them out, verse two. And I love that. God says, I will do it. I will deliver them. You drive them out. I will do my part. You do yours. Why do I find that so important? Because friends, it's the same way God still works in our lives when he desires to rid us of something, to set us free from something. God says, I will deliver you. You need to drive it out. We can pray, God, give me freedom from drugs and lust and bitterness and anxiety or whatever you're in bondage to, and I believe he will deliver you. I tell you, as a church, we would love to lay hands on you, to anoint you with oil, to pray over you that God would set you free from bondages. Again, drugs, alcohol, food, pornography, whatever. I believe the Lord not only can, I believe the Lord will deliver you. Well, then, well, why, why, why am I not free now? Because so often we want to be delivered by the Lord, but we're not willing to do our per part and drive that thing out. We've got to make a decision, a conscious decision. I am going to have nothing to do with that anymore. When the bitterness creeps up into my heart, I'm going to take it to the cross and say, I will not be bitter any longer. I'm going to let the same blood of Jesus that forgives all of my sin cover the sins that have been done against me. Well, if that person's never, never asked for their sorry. Well, I'm not saying the relationship will ever be restored, but you can be set free from bitterness tonight. Every time lust just raises up its ugly heart, you say, no, I am not going to sit and let those thoughts dominate my mind. I, I'm going to instead, the minute the, minute the enemy reminds me of lust, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for this person I know needs Jesus. I'll say, thank you for that reminder, enemy. Okay, here we go. This guy needs to know the Lord. And every time he reminds me, if I pray for someone 800 times a day, I'll pray for someone 800 times a day. Guess what? The, the enemy will figure that out and go, eh, I don't know if I want, I want that happening anymore. God can set you free. You've got to be willing to drive it out. You're anxious. You're anxious. I get it. Our world is anxious right now. There's a lot of things to be anxious about. But God says, worry is a sin, friend. 
And so we've got to take it to the cross too and say, God, yes, there's a lot of things in my life that I have to be anxious over, but I have a God that knows the very heads, the hairs on my head. He knows when one sparrow falls, one little bird, how much more value am I than that little bird? God, I will trust you right now. I'm choosing to trust you over my anxiety right now. God will deliver you. He is able to deliver you. You need to drive it out. We always leave a way to go back. We leave a little, a little, little thing, our, our computers unguarded, some stash somewhere, the relationship unsevered, and God does deliver us. But because we leave a way to go back, eventually a day later, a month later, a year later, we find ourselves in bondage again. God will deliver us. We have to drive it out. I don't know if that'll work. Are you kidding me? Don't be like the children of Israel. <laughs> they stood on the promised land and they go, well, I don't know if God can give us that land. I don't know. And you know what God called that for the rest of their existence? He called it the rebellion. Not a rebellion, the rebellion. When they would not trust God to give them the promises he had given them. When they would not trust God to deliver them from that that wanted to put them in bondage. I don't want to be someone who commits the rebellion. I want to trust God and enter into all that God has for me. Amen? Amen. God's done so much for us. So what do we do? We love him. We trust him. We obey him. Look at chapter 8. Every commandment which you command, you, you must, you must, I command you today that you must careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers that you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know that in your heart, as a man chastised his son, so the Lord chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment of the Lord your God and of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, fig trees, and, and a land that you will eat bread without scarcity, which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you will bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. God says, you need to obey me. And God, listen, 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 I'm almost done. But God's reason for, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not almost done, but that was prophetically speaking. I'm going to be, hoping. God's reason for obedience is he wants him to remember the past 40 years. God allowed times of hunger, of thirst, of worry. And the whole time, God wasn't allowing these trials in their lives because he was bored and wanted to entertainment in heaven. God says in verse five, I did this so you could learn some things about you. That when you obey, things work out. That when you come to God, when you're thirsty, hungry, or scared, he takes care of you. I gave you manna that your fathers had no idea what it was. I just had it appear on the ground. I gave you water out of a rock. How many of you can do that? I let your shoes not wear out. Some people say sometimes like, how in the world could two million people move and survive in the wilderness without any food or water? That's impossible. Yeah, for you it is. God was taking them through the wilderness. This was his work. And God has done so many things like that in our lives. That's who he is. That's the God we serve, friends. And we've got to remember it and obey him. He leads us through difficulties to teach us things about ourselves. Man, I can trust God in greater ways than this. Oh, look, he was faithful again. God is always doing things in my life, in your life, to prepare us, not just listen to me, 
Oh, listen to me, church. Not just to prepare you for heaven. He is. You have responsibilities in heaven someday. I thought I was just going to sit on a cloud and play a harp. That's not a Bible verse, friend. What is a Bible verse is you will rule and reign with Christ. I'm teaching a bunch of princes and princesses here tonight. You're going to rule and reign with Jesus someday. And guess what? Some of you ain't ready. I'm not looking at anybody in specific. I'm just saying you ain't ready. So God has to walk you through some difficulties and teach you to speak the language of faith, to trust him and obey him. He does it with all of us. But he will always be there for you. He always will. He always will. Look, he continues. Chapter 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today. Go in and dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, to people tall and great, to descendants of Anakim, who you know and whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord God has said. Do you not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess the land, but it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It's not because of your righteousness or your uprightness of heart that you go in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you in which he fulfilled the word which the Lord spoke to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Therefore, understand that your Lord, your God, is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. I love how God is just honest. (laughs) God is so upfront with them. He says, there is going to be some difficulties. There are some difficult cities. There are some difficult people that you're going to be up against. But he says, I will be with you. So enter in and conquer. And remember, remember, I'm not bringing you in this land because you are super righteous. Moses goes through the rest of chapter 9 and 10 and just rehearses every rotten thing they had done to the Lord in the last 40 years. And it was to remind them, I'm not bringing you in this land because you're super righteous. I'm doing it, verse 5, because I love you. And the people you're dispossessing are even more wickeder than you. You see, remember, keep in mind, where the nation of Israel sits in the world, especially in the ancient world, so strategic. Look at this map on the screen. Israel, oftentimes, you'll hear, you'll hear, you'll hear Jews, that they, they have this joke when I'm over there, and been over there lots of times. They'll say, God put us in the one place in the Middle East that isn't over a sea of oil. Thank you, Lord, for this promised land because they're surrounded. Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia. I mean, just seas of oil. Now, that's changing in the natural... We'll talk about that some other time. But it wasn't, God wasn't putting them where oil was. That, that wasn't his plan. Every ancient power had to pass through the land of Israel in the ancient world to get to where they were going. Every one. And so God takes his people and strategically puts them there because he wants this culture to spread throughout the world as it has, as it has. The Jews did an excellent job before us Christians even showed up. Spreading the the culture of the word of God throughout the world. And what he didn't want was the culture of the Canaanites. Again, it's just a few weeks away when we get to Joshua and we will deal with once again this question like, kill everybody? I just don't understand. And we'll have a Wednesday night where we'll probably encourage you to send your kids to junior high ministry because we'll get into what they were doing to their children in Canaan. And it's disgusting. It it makes you want to vomit. And it was normal and acceptable. And God says, no more. No more are you going to do that to those kids I'm going to short-circuit them into heaven. And, and I do not want that culture being spread throughout the world. So get rid of them and bring you and me into the land. But, 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 
He says, because I didn't bring you in because you were righteous. Therefore, he warns them, don't think that if you start living like the Canaanites, I'm just gonna go, oh, well, it's okay. No, I'm kicking the Canaanites out because they're Canaanites, because of the way they live. And if you start living like them, why would I want you in the land? And I think that is so important for us to ponder for just a minute. Because you, you know, we're saved by what, friends? Grace, good answer. That's the right answer. You are not saved because you're the best people ever. Some of you are like, I'm pretty close. All right, some of you might be. You're not saved because you're great. You're not saved because you're a great athlete, because you're a great worker, because you're the best and the brightest. That, that's not why you're saved. You are saved because God loves you. Man, let that tear apart your heart. God loves you. He has chosen to pour his love out upon you, and he offers you grace. And most of us are just smart enough to accept it and say, me? You, me? Me? Okay, <laughs> I accept. God's like, okay, <laughs> come here. <laughs> That's how he deals with me, at least. <laughs> We're saved by grace. I'm so thankful for that. But don't then buy into the lie from hell that then it doesn't matter how you live. Because when we're fully convinced that we're saved by grace, and you should be because you are, you then think it doesn't matter how I live. Well, that's not true at all. It doesn't change the way God feels about you. It doesn't change your eternal destiny as long as you are truly saved. But number one, it's gonna mess up your life, and number two, it's gonna kill your testimony. God has put you strategically in a place where what you are learning, how you are growing, can spread to your various spheres of influence all over this world. He put you strategically there, and he put you there, not because you're perfect, because you have a perfect message and a perfect God. And you and I need to take seriously representing him well, being quick to repent when we fail, because we all do, and saying, God, I don't want to mess up this picture. I want to represent you well. That's how I want to do. Obedience pays, friends. As God told the first king of Israel, Saul, he said, behold, obey, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as, is a, is as iniquity and idolatry. Man, to obey is better than sacrifice. Better for who? For you. For you. For you. It's better for you. You. God has given you this law for you. Be he, do you know God's okay, right? What if I don't keep the law? Is God going to be okay? Uh-huh. Just fine. This is for you. It's for your good. It's for your good. Look, look, look at chapter, chapter 10. Verse 12, look, look at this. I'm, I am almost done now, but chapter 10, verse 12. Look, look at this. Th this just this blew me away as I was just reading over this, going, this, God wants us to say this. Chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Uh-oh. To fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to love him and serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all, and to keep his commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. For your good. I just see God in heaven saying, I am just wanting to walk you in all these good things. I am just wanting to bless you. How long will you keep fighting me? Just obey me. In chapter 11, I've run out of time because you guys prayed for me. It's your fault. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as we put this outline of chapter 12, just let's talk through it for two minutes and I'll be done. He says in the verse, first 12 verses of chapter 11, sorry, chapter 11, he says, if you, if you love him, he will bring you into this good land. And God, I, I encourage you to read on your own. He talks about this good land as opposed to the land of, of Egypt. Because Egypt, you, 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 the land was watered by foot. I'm like, what does that mean? 
Well, ancient Egypt, it, it had the Nile River and they would bring the water out. It was like an ancient irrigation and they would have these foot pumps. And so your field, you'd sit there just all day. Just, and that's how they would irrigate their fields. It, it, that's not how it works in Israel. Israel's a land of hills and valleys. And to this day, Israel is dependent on rainfall. And God says, I'm bringing you in a land that I, I water your crops from above. Wow. That's amazing. God says, just obey me. Just obey me. I'm going I'm to bring you into the good land. Trust me. I'll take care of you. He says, though, but if you don't obey me, I'm going to withhold the rain. Why? Because he doesn't, he wants, because he wants them to pray and seek God and get back to him. Sometimes God will do things in our lives to wake us up. Amen? Yes. You've got to remember this every time with trials. Sometimes God brings trials to perfect us. He does. I think of the disciples. He said, go over the Sea of Galilee and I'll meet you. And they went over the Sea of Galilee and that night they encountered a storm like they'd never encountered before. Are we in disobedience? No, you're in perfect obedience. You are doing exactly what God called you to do. Then Jesus just walks out on that storm and he teaches them a whole lot about them and him. And so many times you and I are going through the ringer and, and I know because I asked the same question, what did I do to you? And sometimes he says, that's not, that's not it at all. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to work things into you that can get worked in no other way. Oh. Sometimes, though, he brings trials not to perfect us, but to correct us. Because <laughs> we're like Jonah. He said, go to Nineveh. And we're like, where's the furthest place from Nineveh? Tarshish. And God's like, okay. Get ready for another storm. And uh, fish. And fish breath when he barfs you up all over the shores. And... Did God hate Jonah? Of course not. He was getting Jonah where he needed to be. And some of us need that correction in our trials. God, God says, trust me and I'll take care of you. If you don't, it's gonna, it's gonna be tough because I'm trying to take care of you. And then finally he says, obey me and I'll expand your borders in verses 22 through 32. God says, I wanna give you from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River. <laughs> That's not where they live currently. How different our world would be if the ancient Jewish people had just totally and completely obeyed the Lord. And you can think on that for 30 seconds, but then I want you to think about this. How different would your life be if you completely and totally obeyed the Lord? It's an old Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. The best time to figure out serving the Lord, that would have been 20 years ago for some of you. Second best time is tonight. Say, God, I'm tired of rebellion. I'm tired of doing my own thing, thinking it'll work out better next time. You love, you love me, I just wanna love you. You're so faithful to me, I wanna trust you. And your law is good, I just wanna obey you.